Hello, it's your boy, the one and only Sir Patrick of the Department of Biology. Lecture five is titled Dispersal and Immigration. And with the upcoming exam, we're fast approaching uncharted territory. But keep steadfast, hold your ground. We can do this. Okay, so recall our previous lecture regarding the underlying ecological factors affecting distribution, you may have noticed that in this population dynamic, there is an interplay between different factors that may add the ins and that may subtract or remove individuals from a certain population. These processes or mechanisms include births and immigration for the positive side or increasing side of your population or emigration or moving out of certain species or death of certain species by predation or natural events for example that may remove or out a certain number of individuals from your population so this interplay between different mechanisms like bird immigration death and emigration will of course create a certain dynamics in your population level and we all know that this population is very important since from this population you have certain individuals that can move out and can colonize certain areas. And we all know that the healthier this population is, for example, in a certain continent or certain island, it could be better for that organism. So the genetic potential of this population, if it's genetically healthier or I mean have more numbers in them they can colonize or spread out much greater but we all know that from the previous lecture too that there is a need for a chance event of course to happen first before they can move out or spread out in the entire globe for the outline of our discussion we we'll first have number one the dispersal of different plant species and then we'll move on to number two, the immigration of your animals. When we say immigration, we mean moving out of certain population to another area with the intent to stay there or colonize that area. And then we'll taper off to number three, the invasion biology, the case of your invasive alien species. So as you have noticed, this third part was supposed to be the topic that we could have had this last lecture zoom meeting but since there was you know two typhoons that was in our midst i canceled that meeting but in this third part i'll focus on our reading material and will guide some of you on what key points are included in the exam since i know some of you are really rooting into those portion okay so we'll cap our discussion with that now for the first portion of our lecture we'll focus on dispersal for vegetation more specifically we'll focus on the plant species that get dispersed by different mechanism of seed dispersal so these different dispersal mechanisms are what made these plants very successful at colonizing different island groups or different areas of the world. So it is inherent in them, but they sometimes get helped by different vectors, as what we call them, for transport or dispersal. So seeds are distributed by wind, water, mammals, bird, insect, and mechanical means, and also by man. But no single agency and no combination of agency is entirely satisfactory to explain all the, well, anomalies that we see in the plant distribution in the world without postulating land connection over which plants could march unimpeded at some time or another in the geologic history. Although such land connection may now no longer be evident. But if you think about it, plant species, in a sense, could march over the land. No? There are, of course, strict limitations to the seeds, no? the, the physical characteristic of different seeds for them to acquire the different ability or different mechanisms that 
are mentioned here. For example, this dandelion no, that is dispersed by wind. These seeds of the seeds of this plant must be quite light, no, and unusually small or dust-like, no. If if you think about it, some organisms or some plants that get dispersed by 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 the wind must be really light or dust dust-like. No, they must be provided with some sort of hairs like this or wings, for example, or certain organs. For them to well float in the air and get dispersed elsewhere. So these seeds or kind of fruit have many special adaptation for dissemination by means of wind. So aside from the case, well, we're still on dispersal of seed by wind. Aside from the case of the dandelion plant, we also have the case of some wind fruit, you know, like the case of different dipterocarps. Or these trees, no, the pterocarp trees, and these plant species have certain adaptation to them. No? They have wind fruits for wind dissemination, but they are not as efficient as the dandelion. No? They are not really, well, I can say, for long distance dispersal. They can only get scattered to a certain hundred meters if there are well stronger winds, no. But for the case of most days that doesn't have that gusty wind, they will fall like a more or less near the mother tree. The wings no gives the fruit or the seeds in this case a like somewhat like a gyroscope no? a spinning motion, a gyratory motion that if you look at the video, it spins no? like a helicopter. As it plunges down, so this uh, type of dipterocarps somehow gets spread that way, no? But well, they can retain their vitality for a very short period of time. That's why, although they can get dispersed by wind, they can't really survive that long haul. For the case of well, if you think about um, overseas dispersal. They, they don't get to be dispersed that way. Only short dis burst of distances now because they apparently they can't withstand drying for longer periods of time. So aside from these two, most uh, family plant species under the family Compositae, well this is the largest family of flowering plants that have fruits that is supplied with the tufts of hair known as papus no and other plant families like your apocinaceae and as pediaceae they are supplied with a different kind of well tufts of hair but the important thing is they get to be distributed by winds so another example of dispersal by wind, well, I think would be the case of different orchid species. Since, I mean, different orchid species under the Orchidaceae family. Well, these uh, plant species, uh, I really love. It reminds me of my grandmother. She really loves both terrestrial and epiphytic orchids that are commensals of trees. These uh, plant species, in most of the species under the family Orchidaceae has a fruit capsule of which that, that produces millions of individual seeds that can apparently be adapted to dissemination by wind. No? Yet among all of the families in this flowering plant group is characterized by a high level of local endemism. There's no higher rate of local endemism than your Orchidaceae family. If you want to have, if you want to search for an endemic species of plant, if you find an orchid, that surely be, no? that could surely be one. Try to imagine it this way. They can be dispersed by wind, but if they are dispersed by wind, why is that they are not distributed evenly across our forest or across different regions? of your, well, for the case of the Philippines, for example. Why is that there is a high level of endemism in them? 
local endemism in them. Plants that have a wind type dispersal, this plant species could be distributed all throughout or commonly found elsewhere. But that's, that's not the case for your orchids. Some scientists think that there are certain factors. One limitation on the dissemination of Orchidaceae through the medium of wind is the fact that they are their seeds are super small. No? And since they are minute, they cannot retain their germinating power when subjected to the long drying of the travels by wind. No? So they get to be dispersed by wind, but they can't travel that much. And aside from that, and the most important factor is the symbiotic feature of the group. Most of your Orchidaceae species cannot be, well, brought to different areas or cannot grow to different areas without their fungal symbionts. A very close relationship with their symbiont, with their fungal symbiont. And without this fungal symbiont, they can't really thrive on their own. And some orchid darium in some vendors, I mean, have not been successful at reproducing wild orchids on their home, no? on their store, because they need to inoculate it with, they need, this orchid needs this uh, fungal symbiont for them to grow. That's the thing with this orchid, this orchidaceae group, no? this orchidaceae family. And this mycorrhizal fungi is characteristically found on the roots of the orchid. And it is actually needed no? for the seed. It will, the seed will not develop beyond the embryonic stage without this mycorrhizal fungi. The colonization of the... So the seed needs to be colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi for the seed to germinate. Both in the seed portion, it needs a mycorrhizal association. It needs a colonization of your microbes to the seed for it to germinate. And on the parent plant, no, the mature plant, it also needs a mycorrhizal association for it to certainly grow to a, well, full size. No? It needs that mycorrhizal association, symbiotic association, both in nutrient capture and for water and mineral absorption. Of course, in exchange, the orchid will give up some plant exudates to the, well, we call it food for the fungi, no? So that's the thing of, for this uh, orchid species. Even though the seeds are really small and can be dispersed by wind mechanism, they are not widely spread because of the fungal symbiont that is needed for them to grow, no? It's the big factor from the, for them to colonize. So the next example of seed dispersal would be those seeds that are dispersed by water. The seeds of these plant species must have certain adaptation to them. Number one, they must be lighter than water, meaning they must be buoyant. Number two, they must be impervious to water, meaning water can't get into them to compromise their osmolarity, their germination power. And number three, they must possess a certain faculty of retaining their germinating power for an indefinite period of time. Because if you remember, dispersal by water sometimes require for the seed to be dispersed in vast oceans before they meet a terrestrial habitat or an island. So they must have a viability or germinating power within that long journey, that long haul. Because if they are not adapted to that, they would not succeed in the colonization of different islands. And sometimes these seeds or fruit usually are provided with certain impervious pericarp for them to survive in that long term. With this picture right here. This was one of my field work. I joined my colleague, my friend here, for her experimental phase of her thesis, wherein we measure the diameter of different mangrove species in this forest, you know, mangrove forest, and to, well, to approximate the amount of carbon that this forest is sequestering from, at, at, from our atmosphere. And 
the interesting thing about these mangrove species are they are dispersed by water. So we have different mangrove species. We have what we call the bakawan lalaki, bakawan babae. Mostly these are species for from your Rhizoporaceae. So Rhizopora mucronata, other species of Rhizopora, under Rhizoporaceae. And we also have the Avicennia and other other mangrove species. So there are different mangrove species that are dispersed when, or their propagules are dispersed by water. And this is in Alaminus pangasinan. So other features of the mangroves are, so this is what I am talking about. These are the mangroves propagules. When they are large enough, you can harvest this and you can just, or, or sometimes when they're big enough, they can detach and get dispersed through water. They can float away from this area to another area and settle there. So this picture was taken in Taklong uh, two years two or one year ago. But uh, we had a game there. We actually, there, there's a lot of mangrove propagules. So a lot of mangrove propagules. Some of them are not, like this, no? Some of them are laying on the ground really flat because they have not settled yet. They have been brought by the tides and the waves. So what we'll do is we'll get most of those uh, mangrove propagules and we'll throw them on the ocean. So we'll have a game of spear, spear game, no? The person that can land the mangroves upright wins something like that okay so the fun thing about the that experience was there's a lot of the <laughs> a lot of mangrove propagules and it's like you can't get wrong no even if you throw them haphazardly and it's more actually profitable to them if you throw them away from the previous mangrove patch because they can colonize other areas and they can get dispersed on other areas. So these are organisms or, or plant species or mangrove species that can be uh, dispersed by water. So they need to be impervious to water. They need to have a certain adaptation or flotation. They need to be buoyant in water and they need to have a certain degree of um, germinating capability after the long uh, migration that they took. No? So other organisms that can that are adapted to that way would be most uh, coconut trees because of their impervious pericarp. The fruit is really weird and is adapted to that way of dispersal by water. They can float. And some other beach species like your pandanus. So these are your examples. No? So these, these are beach forests, um, but some of them are brought by humans too. So you can't um, delineate which is which. But I think this pandanus is native to that area. The next would be the seeds that are adapted by or disseminated by mechanical means. No? And what I'm talking about are the seeds that are for the case of this video. So as you can see in this video, these are what we call autochorus plants. No? So these plants are equipped with a certain autonomous mechanism of seed dispersal, if I say it so. So some of these mechanisms provide a certain way of a short to medium dispersal. No? Whereas, kind of ballistic dispersal, no? the, the seeds are thrown away by a certain sudden release. No? So this ballistic dispersal is propelled by an ex explosive force in the fruit in itself. No? Sometimes there is a trip or a lever. No? They can be uh, activated by touch. Some are activated by dryness or wetness, certain things like that. And when they are activated due to the tension in the hygroscopic tissues of the living or uh, living tissues of the plants or the fruit, the sometimes the fruit will burst, no, and will expel the 
the seeds. Okay? So other examples would be your impatience, your touch me not plants, your, your squirting cucumber or equivalium, this the genus equivalium. So in this video, you can see the plant bursting. You know? It's like a really a squirting cucumber. It's like squirting its seeds away. I know it's kind of graphic, but that's how it's, it reproduces. Also some Euperbiaceae are examples of this in which a spring, you know, a spring-like mechanism is um, created when, well, the seeds are scattered for short distances when the fruit dehes or when the fruit uh, dries. No? So the squirting cucumber is a re really graphic illustration of the dispersal of seed by mechanical means. Since when the fruit fully matures, no, it is it gets distended with juice and automatically it like it's like a grenade that opens at the top, you know, at the end, and the seeds are squirted out in a short distances together with the juice that is inside the fruit. So the weird thing about this plant species are they're really amazing. It's like they're explosive triggers. They burst open to release their seed. No? So these are the organisms that are get to be dispersed by mechanical means. The next example of seed dispersal mechanism is dispersal by mammals. I put here an example of a dispersal agent, a vector agent, a, a small mammal for the case. But if you think about it, the animals themselves, the plants can only get dispersed if the animal themselves were able to migrate to different areas of the or different areas or different regions. So the the seeds of these plants needs to have a hard seed no that can pass through the usually there are flesh fruits that needs to pass through the alimentary tract or the digestive tract of your organism. Undigested of course for them to survive no the eating process, the acidic nature of the tummy of the organism. And also the most of these plants that has this dispersal mechanism have fruits that are that can adhere to the fur of your animals. They can have tops of hair or certain setae or bristles that can attach to the fur of the animal so they can get transferred to different areas, okay? So sometimes they can also have fleshy fruits for them to be much more enticing for the animal to eat them. So things like that. So this is also a type of mammal, but it's a flying mammal, of course, which are also involved in the dispersal of your seeds, no? So these are your bats, no? And sometimes, aside from your bats, we also have dispersal by birds. So seed dispersal by birds, just like seed dispersal by your mammals, by your bats, are, of course, limited. Limited by, well, the range of your animal. If the animal has a wide geographic range, of course, the plant or the seeds can be dispersed in that wide geographic range. But if that organism or that bird or that mammal has a only a small range of course the plants or the seeds or the fruits that they eat are only dispersed on that small area too okay so the thing about them is well for the case of bird more specifically they some birds are migratory they can pass one region from one region to another but the thing about it is scientists have, zoologists have pointed out that some migratory birds don't fly with their stomach full. No? So it's highly unlikely for the seeds of these fleshy fruits to get transported over long distances. If the birds fly no? <laughs> or migrate with an empty stomach. So that's the case of your migratory birds. Next would be dispersal by humans. So I put this picture to include my rabbits, but I want you to focus on the example. So the example here are your ornamental plants. No. 
plants or and of course your pine trees so we plant pine trees here and there i've seen pine trees on neva biscaya too planted by some ilocanos of course your ornamentals no ornamental plants the the lantana camara in here in well oblation so those are dispersal by man no so we have a lot of example by of dispersal by man but more specifically they are focused on ornamentals or food like for the case of rice so the chinese brings rice to our culture Astronesian culture and then we plant rice here and there so different rice varieties gets to be introduced gets to kept to be kept in different areas of the Philippines so those no so food source economic thing for materials and so on and so forth there are many examples of dispersal by man and this is actually the growing factor in the dispersal of your uh, plant species no? dispersal by man if you look at the different um, names of the plant species that or that we have you can trace it back to our history actually if you think about it we have of course if if you remember in your hecasi or your um, history history one philippine history we have the Spanish Acapulco trade route, no? the Galleon trade route. So, some, no? some names of your plants are somehow Aztec, name, modified Aztec or Spanish name. No? So, if you look at those plant species, for example, your Kamanchili, Kakawate, Kamote, Tomato, Kalachuchi, chico, cacao, achuete, zapote. Those are common examples of Aztec or Mexican, no? No, modified Aztec name because these plant species are introduced during that trade, no? During the early days of the Philippines, the Philippines is actually very famous in this Manila Acapulco trade route. And during that time, this plant species gets to be introduced in our region. No? So Mexican Aztec um, fruits or plant species gets to be introduced in us, in our country, that way. So if you look at their name, it, it sounds Spanish because, because it sounds Spanish because it was introduced during that time, Spanish time. And it's Mexican in origin because we just like Mexico, we are both, no? We are the Mexican Asians, actually. So that's that. So aside from that, we also have Indian, Indian introduced, no? Indian, Indian species of plants. We have, uh, of course, these Indian species are through Malaysia and the Buddhist and the, the Buddhist portion well, the Buddhist portion of your Malaysia and Brahman, the Java Sumatra region. And these um, plant species naman have specific sound to it too because they are definite Sanskrit. No? Since it is Sanskrit, of course, these species are also introduced to us from in the Indian continent. So we have your Sulasi, Lasona, Malungay, Kastuli, Patola, Champaka, Lagundi, things like that. <laughs> and of course, we will not discount the presence of your Chinese, no? Chinese plant introduction. We have a long history with the Chinese. Before the colonization of the Spaniards, before anything, we are, well, the people in the Philippines are, and some, for some time have been trading with the Chinese and of course in that trade you will almost always encounter an introduction of species so if you hear the sound batao, sitao, kuchai, pechai, ongsoy those are 
the Chinese introduce um, plant species. So, if you if you look at the sound of that, the the names of the species, you will kind of trace its history or its introduction or where it's from. That's why it is important to have a local name of that species. Because if we have a local name of that species, maybe that species is Malay in origin or here in the Philippines itself or endemic in the Philippines. So things like that. That's why in taxonomy, we usually ask the local bears to describe or name what what they call the plant no? that we're describing if we ha they have a local name for it so that's why it's important too so i did include the dispersal via well by insect because well some seeds are dispersed by insect but they are relatively small no? in ano, and mostly insignificant in the larger scheme of things so we have talked about the viability of the seeds no because it doesn't end with the dispersal ability of that seed that seed after being dispersed after having the adaptive cap capability to be dispersed by water by wind etc etc they need to be established we need to talk about that establishment no the species or that organism must be established in the new environment so this is manifested by the seed or, or any species in which the seed is adapted to grow in the open area on the new area they have colonized if they germinate but they fail to establish in that region no then the species will eventually die or lose its um the battle of dispersal no so when the seed is deposited in the new region that for example is deposited on a highly forested area where is there is much competition of course it cannot establish itself there because it will fail to establish itself there because the species have a lot of competition no <coughs> this is especially for the case when your seeds are deposited in your grasslands or cultivated areas for example or mature forests since in these areas there are other competing you know, organisms present, especially for your grassland and your forested area, the newly seed that have been brought there by dispersal cannot colonize because there is not enough space for it to grow. <coughs> Remember, they are fighting for sunlight, these plants, okay? And for the case of cultivated area, even if the seed, the weeds, are get to be dispersed in that area, the farmers would spray pesticides or herbicides, I mean, to those weeds so it will kill them. Again, it is a thoroughly established fact that many species occur in nature only in acid soils or in certain types of soil. So it is... So this acidity or neutrality, the alkalinity of the soil, for some species are a necessity for them to establish you know, the ability of them to fail or successfully establish in that area. Likewise, many species are adapted to neutral or alkaline soil. <coughs> so those are the limiting factors. No? So other limiting factors aside from the pH of the soil for the organism to be established is the altitude, the salinity, the temperature, the humidity, the seasonal dis distribution, the rainfall. All of those factors that we discussed on the on lecture two. So those factors are the limiting factors that are really evidently affecting the viability or establishment of your seed. So viable fruits or seeds may of many species are sometimes transmitted through ocean currents, and these um, ocean currents in our well in our the vast on of our oceans no are really important. If you trace the ocean currents in the Pacific and then all. You can see how these organisms are transported in that way or are colonized in that way. No? So sometimes your fruits or seeds may be transmitted through ocean currents, but frequently they fail to establish the new locality owing to the fact that 
the region, the new region that they have been stranded to is, have been already occupied to its fullest extent no, by other plant species. So even though there are always a new arrival, there has no chance to, for them to gain footing or for their seed to even germinate because they are, there's no space for them literally. Now, since we're talking about dispersal, we can also talk about the pivotal part of this dispersal process in the revegetation of certain volcanic islands after its eruption. Or how, how vegetation can colonize new land, like your Hawaiian islands or your volcanic islands, and so on and so forth. So if you think about it, these dispersal mechanisms are important in the recolonization process or revegetation process of that area. So even though the, the land area have been cleared due to the eruption this last uh, January, since there are uh, plant species and organism here you know, still present, it can just happen that this plant species, species can get dispersed back or can get reintroduced in that area. You know? by uh, those different dispersal mechanisms, by wind, by uh, mammals, by flying mammals, by uh, birds, and so on and so forth. So that's how important it is. Comparing the case of Taal, no? Taal volcano to Krakatao, the volcanic island of Mount Krakatao, there are differences in the colonization. For, in contrast, no? the vegetation this is a study done by Ernst, E-R-N-S-T, by Ernst. So his study proves that the revegetation of Krakatao and Taal is different from each other. For the case of Taal, the dispersal by birds is the most efficient medium on, in transmitting the seeds. No? Since, if you think about it, transmission by birds, of seeds by birds, is efficient on short distances since sometimes the food or it's a fact that the food remains in the elementary track of the birds for a short time, no? usually for 30 minutes to 3 hours. And zoologists have proven that in the migration process of the birds, they travel on an empty stomach so they are lighter. Mostly for an isolated island like your Krakatao or like Hawaii, the dispersal mechanism that are at play is most of the time, according to the study of urns, is your dispersal by water and sometimes by wind too. Okay? So that's the thing, the different thing, the difference between the two. So if you look at it this way, there are a lot of factors, a lot of dispersal mechanism. And some of that are the majority of, in recolonization of a certain barren island, for example. Some of that or a mixture of that would be the case of how an island can be revegetated or how an island can get recolonized. So there is a certain combination no, of the processes. And no single agency or no combination of agency is entirely satisfactory to explain all the anomalies. It is actually purely case-to-case -case basis. So yeah, seed dispersal has many consequences for both ecology, biogeography, and the evolution of plants. Dispersal is necessary for the ability, an important factor, of whether or not a species can be transported to a new habitat. No? can be part of the recolonization process of your area, like for the case of your Taal, your Mount Krakatao, your Hawaii, and also for also conservation efforts. No? This dispersal mechanism can be the key for revegetating or recolonizing a barren area after an eruption of, or after a certain event. No? And in all of these um, processes in which a landscape has been cleared totally, there is a certain degree of succession, what we call them in ecology. So these succession events, successional events, would first, of course, 
after the the natural event, natural catastrophe, would be the first step would be the recolonization of your pioneer species, as we call them. These pioneer species are what we call the first hand species. No, they are the first to go in that area. These are the cases of your grasses, your small plants, no, the grass plants, talaga, the weeds, as we call them, and. These grasses, these pioneer species would actually create that initial step of trying to convert the land into a forest area or a climax area. So after the pioneer species like your, after the small grasses would be the presence of your uh, certain broad leaves like your macaranga plants. These are pioneer species too. So the presence of Initial increments of your grasses, then followed by uh, certain broadleaf species, your macaranga plant. Other broadleaf will soon take over. And then after the establishment of this broadleaf species will come the, well, let's fast forward. A certain generation will come your primary growth, secondary growth, and the climax species, which is a fully grown forest so this is a successional event no? so uh, after the uh, the eruption event the catastrophe the clearing of the landscape would be the pioneer species then certain broad leaves certain larger than larger plants and then trees of established growth and then the climax species wherein we have different um, organism or different um, biodiversity composition no? <clears throat> so it's a successional story, the story of dispersal. And this dispersal mechanism are pivotal in that sense, no? So, not only in Mount Inatubo, no? not only in those areas, we can also apply it on the, the effects of this dispersal mechanism on the colonization of your riverbanks, of your wetlands, no? So, certain riverbanks can be established with we all know erosion can be a very devastating thing for river sites, no? the people living near river. And if you have a lot of plants or trees or shrubs that are growing near that river, it can stabilize that river bank so that it doesn't erode that much. No? So it is, it is important in that way sometimes. And the dispersal abilities of this organism plays a critical role in that area all of those um mechanisms the wind and such and such are important in that <laughs>